starting to get a little bit spicy. You can see it's wet cappy. Amazingly, I'm now in the flood tide and it's doing what I was hoping it would help me do, which is just move toward Palo Alto. The first hour was windless and, this, and then I, I, got, I got the wind. This looks like it's a part of my boat. That's a little disturbing. I want to say thanks to all those who've been checking out my sailing vids and following along. This was my first multi-day dinghy cruise. I set out to sail to Palo Alto in time for my dad's birthday. It was pretty ambitious. It's 30 miles south. I knew that there was going to be some winds predicted for the afternoon. It's, it showed a windy icon on Google that morning but I decided to go for it. The feeling here is like, wow, it's working. I can't believe it, I'm doing it. Nice. I, think it's raining. I can see the San Mateo Bridge ahead of me. I'm like going towards it in a straight line with good forward speed. I'm in control of my boat, I'm comfortable. Looks like I'm even gonna get there on time. But then things picked up a notch. Unfortunately, I don't have all the footage because the battery died on my action cam, but this is the best stuff that I have. This is probably around 20-25 knots of breeze. I'm still pretty much in control. The waves are kind of following me diagonally. I'm doing a lot of surfing. You can see the expression of surprise and glee from how fast I'm going. Especially surprised considering that the first hour and a half there was zero wind and I was rowing underneath the Bay Bridge. And then the wind just started growing and growing. Now I've got enough forward speed to have a really respectable wake and rooster tail behind me. And I'm feeling good. But if this wind continues, I'm like, whoa, I'm not sure I'm ready for it. And it did, it just continued picking up. The wind and the wind waves kept going another major notch higher. This is good forward speed. This is the fastest I've ever sailed. And I'm feeling like, wow, it's working. This is amazing. But it's starting to freak me out a little bit too. getting crazy out here. I am not going to risk getting, going to get a wind measurement right now. I'm just putting in a stopper knot. <sighs> just breathe, just breathe. Wow. I'm feeling so lucky to be here in this safe harbor. Basically, I had been trying to make radio contact with the Coast Guard and then the I kept hearing Coyote Point and I didn't know if it was the Coast I thought it was the Coast Guard telling me where to head I kept trying to sail because I thought that having some speed through these larger and larger waves uh, would be helpful to my safety when I decided to use the radio uh, which I've never done before I, I um, didn't think to lower the sail. It might have helped. It might have helped me because if I had lowered the sail, then I the waves weren't really breaking. They were just very large. Um, if I had lowered the sail, the chance of one breaking on me, pretty small, and I could have used the radio. Anyway, I started using the radio, but I was sailing with one hand and using the radio with the other. And that means I was holding both the tiller and the sheet with one hand. Not a good situation because your gust management is, you know, nil. 
you want to do that with two different hands. And so I was like, oh, should I hold the radio and listen for a response or should I put it down? And fortunately, I did have a good place to clip it. Um, but when I had it clipped, I could hear when someone was talking, but I couldn't hear the words until I lifted it to my ear. So it was really challenging. And then um, at one point, I got a, a message that said, um, the boat near San Mateo Bridge, because basically I wasn't even good enough using the radio to say, like, this is first mod. I kept saying, this is Paul Friedman. <laughs> This is Paul Friedman on the first mod small sailboat. There's a plane. There's a plane coming in. We're, we're at an airport. I'll just show you that. It's kind of cool, actually. Anyway, at one point, I got a message. Uh, the boat near San Mateo Bridge. Will you please repeat your position? This is Coyote Point. And that was loud and clear. So I was like, okay, this is on. I have contact. So I very clearly stated my position to the best of my ability you know i'm north of the san mateo bridge i'm on par with where the uh, kite surfers are i'm heading towards land i'm big i was basically heading towards san mateo downtown and then i saw the, the red flashing lights so they come out to me in a boat power boat with two engines you know good rescue boat and one of them was coiling a line and I could see that he was trying to get me ready to tow and the other one was the captain and his name was Mark uh, the one coiling the line was named Adam and Mark was talking to me but we were you know a uh, hundred feet away and it was windy and he I was saying do you think I can make it um, and he said you have to get into the channel and he pointed to the channel which was well windward of where I was. Here's another one. It's going to be like this. Okay, so they're basically showing me where the channel markers are and it was going to be probably impossible to get upwind. I said, I can't do it. And I lowered my sail and later Mark told me, uh, that was a good call. Lowering your sail was good, clear communication with us that you wanted to tow because it was hard to communicate. I didn't know that I wanted to tow and then I decided I wanted to tow and the waves were so big that the tow rope was getting submerged in waves, but fortunately it was long enough. It was my painter and fortunately it was long enough that I felt safe on the tow. Their boat was getting tossed around and I took some footage of it and yeah, it was it was a it was a rescue. I, I got rescued. They were actually planning for what might happen if I got in trouble on the tow, like if if my bow got stuffed in a wave and and started dragging or something. They were gonna cut the rope and re and focus on rescuing me and not focus on rescuing my boat. They were talking like that in their own cabin. They had a a, a screen, you know, a shield for the waves. I didn't. I was getting just really nailed. I had my sailing top on and I tightened the neck for the first time, really wanted the neck to be, you know, really like a dry top. We decided that I was gonna hurl them a line because I already had it tied to my bow and I knew I needed to coil up part of it so it had like some weight to it. So I coiled about half of it and I tried to bundle it nice and tightly. I got ready to toss it. I gave it a hurl and my heave was kind of weak sauce. But then Adam reached into the water and plucked it out of the water as the, the rescue boat was going by. We all breathed a sigh of relief and then got the tow started. So today I'm waking up in Coyote Point in my beautiful boom tent. And it's tall enough for me to stand up in. Check this out. I can stand up inside. You know, it's true luxury. <laughs> on, a, on a boat, normally you need a 30 foot boat to be able to stand up inside. So, here we go. 
Um, I'm gonna walk back to the galley right now. Slash chart table. And I'm gonna have myself some breakfast. And then right around here, I started maybe thinking I should do downwind tacking because it's too gnarly. But I was heading towards land on my first downwind tack when things got weirder and weirder. And then this is probably where I made contact with Coyote Point, and I would have had to, I would have had to sail upwind to get into the channel. So that would have required some tacking. But I'm telling you, it was hard to make way. This is the other seat in my glamper. Now I'm calling the first mod a micro glamper. This is the second seat. So this is one of the positions I can lounge in here, right here. A very important bed position. I can, I can hang out on that. And then when I'm like, you know, reading a map, I can do it right here on my chart table. And then the chart table is also where I'm gonna make a coffee and have a little bit of a breakfast. So that's my plan. I'm gonna have, uh, get some food in me. Then I'm actually gonna bust down the entire tent for a very special purpose, which is to go sailing with my dad on his birthday. He's turning 82 today and we are gonna sail earlier in the day than where I got caught yesterday. We're gonna be sailing from 11 to one, so that should be pretty pretty mellow, pretty safe, and pretty enjoyable. And uh, we'll be out for an hour or two. I'll try to get a little bit of footage of that as well. All right, this is the return leg now of the dinghy cruise, and I'm rowing myself out into the main flow of the ebb tide. Making pretty good progress because the ebb tide has already begun and the ebb tide is supposed to be peaking in about one hour. So I'm still south of San Francisco airport, which I can see right there on my port side. How's that, sailors? I knew it was the port side, even though it was on my right. And, you know, normally you're supposed to remember that port has the same number of letters as left. So obviously I got no wind right now, but I'm just trying to get out into the tidal flow because if I can float for an hour and gain two miles, that sounds pretty good. That might be half an hour less sailing later on in the day. So this trip has given me a real uh, cause for celebration and also cause for reflection because the celebration is that I had this image in mind of what it would be like to sail to Palo Alto to get to my dad's birthday by sailboat and more or less, I did it, and I had um, a whole day to spend with my dad on his birthday, including sailing and dinner, and it was great. So it's like dreams coming true on the one hand. Um, on the other hand, I took off on Sunday in very calm conditions like this. I had to row underneath the Bay Bridge to get anywhere for the first hour. Um, and then later on, they turned into such strong winds that the waves were over six feet or up to six feet. Harbor Master Mark said that the waves were four to six feet at the time of the rescue, so I have no reason to doubt him. So he's saying that it was four to six feet, four to six foot waves. He also told me that it was a 28, mile, uh, 28 knot sustained average for 10 minutes. 10 minutes sustained average was 28 with gusts to 35 or higher. And I was out in that wondering what the hell am I supposed to do? Because it started right around here. And, and 
ended up getting rescued. So that's the reflection part because, you know, I have this image of myself being able to go places. But the reality is that if I were to avoid small craft advisory days, there's not that many days left in the summertime. And the only way to really not get caught in those conditions is to be pretty cautious about which days I sail. So that's kind of the cause for reflection part. And then additionally, I have to say my boom tent still takes a solid hour and a half at least to set up. So I have to redesign that to be quicker. I want to get it down to 15 minutes. 15 minutes would be amazing but it's nowhere close to 15 minutes right now. But on the plus side, the boom tent is so nice to be in once it's set up. I mean, it's perfect. Really, really comfortable bed. And it's like a special hotel that's really hard to get to. It's like a little space capsule. I really, really like being in it, but it's not practical to take an hour and a half to set it up. It just it needs to be improved. I gotta work on that some more. Bicycle toad, dinghy cruising, micro glamping. Bike toad, micro glamper. Bike toad, micro cruiser. There were a lot of small boats at the marina. This was probably the lightest. 350 pounds, plus all my gear. There is no wind, so this is actually the speed of the tide. That's kind of cool to see. Planning my trip around the tide, I am able to make quite a bit of forward progress. Now I've passed San Francisco airport you can see there's a plane taking off in the very distance there. That's SFO. I was well south of that today. Even though there's very little wind, I'm actually kind of cruising. Look. One minute has gone by and that's how far I've gotten from that channel marker. Working with the tide is an essential aspect on a boat with no motor. I am thinking about putting a motor on this thing, but uh, it's a project because I want to do it my way, you know? That means it's going to be electric, not gas. That means it's going to be battery interoperable with the electric bike. That means that it's going to be relatively ultra light and it's going to be a project. So I don't have that yet, but if I did have that, I could zoom across the water right now and get home so quickly, turning this boat into a more, more of a self-rescuable boat. Because if I had had the motor and, and if it had the ability to go five miles or four miles pretty fast, like I don't need it to go fast all the time, but if it if it can get me to the side of the bay quickly, like which often is less than two miles, and if I can get upwind with it, then that could be a major, major safety improvement. So I'm heading that direction, I think. Right now I'm at the point where I wanna have these adventures and crawl into my little capsule at night. I'm gonna plan my next adventure according to the strengths of this boat and the biking system. 
and that will probably mean staying overnight tw you know two nights in, in places because then I can leave my my little covered wagon up and I can visit people potentially or I can just relax um, that sounds pretty good to me the the part of setting it up and tearing it down every day which is roughly three hours a day of work tying a lot of extra little knots using a lot of office clips to clip the fabric you know that's it's a prototype still so I have to push through and I once took a I, I guess I want to talk about pushing through you know as an inventor as anyone that makes something which boat builders are basically inventors even if they're following plans but particularly for anyone who wants to push things in a new direction. So like for me on this trip, um, the passion was with, just, this is where I'm sitting, I just want you guys to see what's happening here. We're on the very stern of the boat. That's how fast we're going, pretty chill conditions. So I can sit here and talk and kind of like just keep vlogging. <laughs> the first mod project here but yeah I want to talk about what the, the feeling of being an inventor innovator um, having a vision in your mind of something that's possible and then the feeling of running into some of the early resistance and blocks for example right now I believe that it was possible to stand up inside my my boat which most boats this size you cannot stand up at night in your little boom tent you have to just accept the compromise of stooping over inside your boom tent because otherwise it's kind of too hard and also it puts a light a high profile to the wind so i had a hunch that i could do it last night um, when i was setting up the tent there was some moderate winds probably like 10 knots or something in the marina and the tent was kind of bulging but it never failed because I had made all this carbon fiber custom work and so basically it was a very strong proof of concept then the wind died overnight two nights in a row the wind was nothing at night which meant really great sleeping and then when I did need to get up in the night I was able to stand so I had this experience of actually getting out of my bed which was not on the floor but it's at bed height swinging my legs over standing taking two steps or whatever I need to do, maybe to pee, and then walking back to my bed and climbing in bed and having a super comfortable bed. So it's like getting signs that it's working, but then there's signs that it's not quite working. So like hour and a half minimum time to set up a boom tent does not seem very compatible with a lot of the adventure ideas that I, that I have for the, for the coming year or for the coming stretch it just it feels like it's asking myself to do too much work and then when I look around the marina and I see all these boats that have a built-in bedroom called the cabin and they don't have to set anything up for an hour and a half I think to myself why am I pushing so hard to do this bicycle compatible thing when I could just go up to a 22 foot or a 25 foot sailboat and hopefully that's big enough to stand up inside and then I'm kind of done and it has a built-in bedroom so I am thinking about those things but then I'm recalling that I did a life coaching with Maria Nemeth America uh, Academy of Coaching Excellence Academy of Coaching Excellence based in Sacramento and she had this analogy that I thought was really compelling which was that you know when you try to bring something to life a dream of yours it doesn't have to be an invention it could be any project any anything that you're working on you're gonna do a lot of work at first and it's going to be moving the project forward but it will appear that you haven't gotten very far and the analogy is the space shuttle taking off because the space shuttle uses 90% of its fuel to go the first 10 feet of altitude. Just to get off the ground, it uses 90% of its energy. And then once it's moving, it's like, doesn't need to use as much energy because it's actually already done the hard part. So she encouraged me to think, to look at things that way. And 
I feel like the boom tent is in that category where I've done the 90% of the work. I've done a, taken myself on a, on a now a three day dinghy cruise, but I have a little bit more to do. And so when I see it like that space shuttle that's basically already there, then it encourages me to put the last 10% in versus seeing it as like not there. You can look at it and it's like, oh, that's not there yet because clearly three hours a day of setup and tear down for a tent is not really worth it. Like it's the novelty is gonna wear off, you know? I'm, and plus I've already spent so many hours in the workshop making these carbon fiber parts. So I could go down this mental path of feeling like kind of like a failure at it because I've put so many hours in and I've excluded other things that I might have been doing with that time, like, you know, giving my energy to rock the bike, core business, versus doing my thing in my custom lab. So I am, you could see it as a failure. It's like, well, I've spent all this time and I still only have something that takes three hours a day to deal with after sailing. You know, that's just not practical. So seeing it the, the Maria Nemeth way, where she's like, no, you've already done most of the work. You just have to push through. You just have to get through the last little bit. This is just a beautiful experience. So I think I'm gonna stick with it. All right, so now we've got the breeze, we've got the tide, and this is the fun part, the easy return leg. I am counting my blessings that uh, my boat made it, that I made it. Um, so I think I'm gonna get home, rest, spend some time with Deanna and Spirit. But uh, man, what a range of conditions, because I was in the same spot. Trying to get through the San Mateo Bridge in four foot waves, having a blast until it went up a notch. And that was two days ago. Full sail here, because we're only in eight knots of breeze. All my adventure gear. Now it's getting a little bit um, spicier, but uh, still pretty easy to control. And I'm expecting there to be a significant wind shadow here, but I didn't expect it to be I guess, as shadowy as this. had quite a wind shadow and uh, I wasn't quite ready for it I was a little bit too close so I switched to oars and I'm gonna give this one over here a much bigger berth so I can try to keep my forward momentum I want to establish some good forward speed because that's gonna help me go right between these two towers. So it's a little bit concerning, um, but the tide is not very strong right now. Just got honked at by this container ship. And I would say that it has the right of way in this situation. So I tacked, give it a little bit of room to move. Plus I wanna be able to go right between the two towers of the Bay Bridge. I don't wanna be between the land and the first tower. So I'm gonna let the container ship go and then I'm gonna do my tack. And look at that, it's gonna pretty much block the sun here. This is global commerce resuming after COVID these ships have been stacked up in the bay and now they are finally getting unloaded. See, these are not goods going from the USA to China. These are goods coming from most likely China to the USA. 
and they've been waiting and waiting. And there is a marine animal right there. I've got to say, it's either a marine animal or a big piece of trash. It looks like a seal. Oh yeah, that's cool. Nice. It's blocking the Bay Bridge. It's blocking most of the city. MSC Jade versus First Mod. It is clear who has the right of way there. And now I'm in their wind shadow. And they are doing it. Look at that. Look at that system. I think they're under their own power, but the tugboats have the ability maybe to accelerate and turn them, these pilot boats. Fantastic. I think this thing's just turning around. That was what the whole fuss was about. Wow. Just doing a do, -si -do with this container ship right now. It's one of my favorite spots to sail. Pretty calm today. At this speed, the auto bailer is just catching up to the, all the water that was in the boat. That is the northern tip of Treasure Island and that um, spot has some really confused seas. So I'm gonna be well clear of it today. I'm right out in the middle. This is, I think, close to slack tide. So everything's handling real well. And this is when I take my next turn which is probably gonna be a jibe heading to Emeryville. That'll be my last turn of the day. Thanks for watching. That's what I got. I really appreciate you following along with my adventures in low carbon fun. Please help me along on YouTube by liking, subscribing, sharing, commenting, and I hope that this inspires you to get involved and try out low carbon fun in your own life. This is Paul Friedman, otherwise known as Fossil Fool, signing out.